Welcome everyone to Topic Wonders number 15. I am your host, Matrix Lord 212, and I'm with Steampunk Star Raisin. Of AmberStreet.com here in Hollywood. What's up, Ray? I am really fascinated. <laughs> and where are you from, Ray, for the viewers? I'm from the UK, you know. All right. Okay, so here we go. I have a crazy, crazy question for you, Steampunk. Okay. Were hydroglyphics what we call emojis today? Back then? Was that their emojis? Well, they're pictographs. They're, it's, a yeah. form of, it's a form of written language. Correct. It, it uses pictures as symbols to mean certain uh, syllables. Correct. Like we, do, like we do emojis. Now, what happens to say the human race gets wiped out and the only thing that they have left is our stupid emojis? Are they going to think well, like we're some ancient civilization with you know what I'm saying? It's like kind of crazy. Well, we have those I, I, yeah, well, I mean, if, if our civilization got wiped out, which would be most likely by nuclear war, because so many countries have nuclear But I'm saying the craziest uh, thing to survive is stupid emojis on, like, a thing. Well, I, rock, I, I, I think yeah, it depends on what point in time. But, yeah, like, if you had, like, um, like say, I'm, I'm just going to say more probable, like a nuclear war and – Cities were buried for a couple thousand years, and then right. mankind started to come back, and they dug up some emojis. They may not be able to translate them. But they may not know what – they may think, like, we're, like, an ancient civilization like Egypt, like, and that we were, like, doing stuff like that. They don't know what the hell that is. Well, the only, the only reason why they were able to translate hieroglyphics – see, see pictograph languages are very hard to translate if you don't have a Rosetta Stone. Right. Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone was written in like ancient Greek because of the Ptolemy uh, Empire, which was one of uh, Alexander the Great's generals who inherited that kingdom, uh, had written the Rosetta Stone, and part of it was ancient Greek, uh, ancient Egyptian, and I think Latin or another language. There was a couple of other languages, so it made it very easy to cross-reference and translate. Um, right. There's there's actually languages that are that are pictograph languages that they don't have a Rosetta Stone and they're nearly impossible to translate. One of those is uh, Linear A, which uh, probably the Minoans wrote uh, in Linear A, but they, they've got a lot of tablets in Linear A and they're not able to translate it, but it does have some resemblance to Linear B, but they're still not able to make a direct correlation between the two uh, types of scripts and and i know that there's another language in the middle east um in the uh in what was ancient india um that's also a pictograph language that they've not been able to translate okay what language that was referenced to and i'm not an archaeologist but i i vaguely remember reading about it i, I i'm fascinated with lost languages anyway but yeah so yeah text but yeah emojis if, if somebody 2,000 years from now were to find them and civilization was destroyed in between, they would really have a hard time translating them because their meaning of the pentagraph would be different than ours. Right. Okay. Very good. Very good explanation. Very well thought out. Now go on to your article. Well, I, I know that there was uh, – I've been trying to talk about this for a couple of weeks, but you said you wanted to save it for Topic Wonders. I know Stephen Hawking talked about a few weeks ago, and I, and I, and I think it's highly probable that uh, he was talking about sending microscopic spacecraft or very small spacecraft. Yes. Like Alpha Centauri and using ion propulsion, which they've already used in some larger unmanned spacecraft, to uh, send spacecraft to like Alpha Centauri. Because Alpha Centauri is only – like 4.5 light years away. And using ion propulsion, uh, you can slowly accelerate the spacecraft over time. And because there's no friction in space, the longer it goes out, the faster it accelerates. And I, I think from what I remember reading, you could get up to about 20% to maybe 30% the speed of light. So you could maybe send a unmanned uh, micro spacecraft to Alpha Centauri and it would get there in about 20 years. But they decided to send hundreds, right? Just in well, case some got destroyed. Yeah, I would think that would be prudent because it's such a small spacecraft that could easily get destroyed. And Mark Zuckerberg was going to get in on that too, right? From I, haven't, I haven't read about that. He's going to donate his I, I, money too. 
I heard. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I think that's a good cause. I mean, we have the technology right now, but nobody wants to invest in infrastructure anymore. If we were willing to spend $50 billion on a spacecraft, but we're not willing to spend $50 billion on a spacecraft, it would probably cost a few hundred billion to research the technology, but you could, you could build a spacecraft with nuclear propulsion where you, you uh, recycle old nuclear weapons and you have a blast plate. Engineers in the 50s had a... But didn't they invent or, or on the verge then, of where you would have a blast warp drive? And, well, the problem with warp drive is that it's, that hasn't been discovered yet. So you, they have blueprints for an antimatter reactor. The problem is, is getting antimatter. You know, it's like that one episode from, you know, and I, and I, I will counter to anybody who says that the first two seasons of Next Generation didn't have good episodes. There was that one episode from uh, season two of Next Generation where Jordy is fixing up the old ship because they're doing war games, and then the Ferengi attack. And uh, he had, uh, the ship was totally dead, had hardly no energy. The warp drive was offline. And then Wesley Crusher brought in his experiment, which generated a little bit of antimatter. But basically, because Star Trek is based on theoretical physics, he had this whole warp drive assembly, but it was offline because he had no antimatter. And you can't make antimatter out of nothing. You've got to get it from something. And luckily, Wesley Crusher was a genius. And he was able to bring his experiment, which he was able to generate a little bit of antimatter so that the ship could travel at warp speed for like a microsecond. And that, that was a really cool episode because they were working with limited resources. But uh, the problem with building an antimatter reactor is that the, is trying to harvest antimatter. Uh, the only antimatter that they, they've been able to harvest are microscopic amounts, like a few atoms at a time. And you end up spending more energy than what you get in return. You would need to find a natural way to harvest antimatter to build an antimatter reactor. They, they think they might be able to do that in the future because some lightning storms generate antimatter. And if you could just slowly have magnetic containment, which is from Star Trek, but that's actually based on theoretical physics, that if you were going to gather antimatter, you would have to have a magnetic field to contain it so that it wouldn't react with the matter and explode. And, um, you know, uh, right now we're not at the, the stage where we could collect enough antimatter to build an antimatter reactor. The two practical technologies for interstellar space travel would be uh, a um, laser sail ship. I know that sounds crazy, but that's something that the engineers have devised. It reminds me of Enlightenment episode with well, Doctor Who, where they had, a, they had something like that with the Black Guardian, the Fifth Doctor. I right, got oh, okay. I, I hadn't seen that one, but the uh, yeah the laser the laser light ship would be would have a vulnerability is that if the power supply got cut on Earth, then the ship would be screwed. We could get stranded in deep space with no power or limited power. The because you would basically have a high powered laser, which would be supported by the electrical grid, or you might even have like a nuclear power plant that would provide power to this high-powered laser, and it would beam energy into space, and the ship would have a laser uh, light solar cell, just kind of similar to a solar cell, but designed, but much more sophisticated to, as a receptacle to take the laser, and the laser would provide energy for the ship, and in theory, if you were willing to develop the appropriate infrastructure, the ship within like one to two years could accelerate in deep space to probably about 20% the speed of light. But you know, like I said, you would, the, the co actual cost of the ship would probably cost about 50 billion in today's dollars. And then you would need a, probably about three or $400 billion in research to test the design and, and, and work at all the bugs. And then um, the, um, another practical technology for interstellar travel, like I was talking about earlier, Nuclear propulsion, uh, which is a little bit more practical because you just use nuclear weapons as a fuel, mm -hmm. you know, and you, the ship would look really weird. You would have like a crew capsule with a long cable and then you would have, I've seen blueprints of it, and you would have like a big pressure plate. You might even have two or three pressure plates. And these pressure plates would, that would be attached to a cable and it would go out for miles from the ship or the might, you know, because you would deploy these pressure plates in deep space, so you would you would want to get 
on the outer edge of the solar system into interstellar space, and you might use rocket propulsion initially to leave the solar system. And then you, once you got to the outer edge of the solar system, you would deploy these pressure plates, and then uh, you would deploy the nuclear weapons on the other side of the pressure plates. The pressure plates would be a blast shield, and uh, would shield you from the nuclear explosion, but the, the, the force would propel the ship forward. And you would have as much fuel as, as you had nuclear weapons. Wow. You would just, you know, the engineers in the 50s were thinking, well, you know, we're going to have all these weapons, nuclear weapons that are going to decay. And, and, you know, nuclear weapons, you can't just keep them forever. They eventually go bad if you right. don't use them. So they were like, how can, we, how can we recycle these old nuclear weapons? And they were, when NASA used to have a lot more funding than it does today, because NASA's budget's been slashed, they were talking about building a nuclear propulsion ship. But they, those plans were canceled and never got past the blueprint. Today. But not, they, do you think now is more of a chance of that stuff happening? Probably not. Like who's holding that back, the president? Oh, I would say Congress. Congress is the one that provides funding. The president signs it into law. You know, the so couldn't budget. the president propose and then they, they draw up a bill? Well, they, the proper problem, funding? Well, the problem is, is that the, um, this Congress has been more obstructionist than any other Congress before. Like they, they've shut down the government. They've threatened to shut down the government. They shut down the government, I think, twice. Uh, and um, hardly anything gets passed that uh, increases spending on any kind of infrastructure or any kind of scientific research. They've cut a lot of things. Mm. But, uh, but I, I just don't think the problem, also the problem is, is that we got, the United States has their thumb in everybody's pie around the world. Um, I'm, uh, they basically, the United States is spending 53% of all discretionary spending on the military for mm. never ending wars that just keep going on for infinity. And so, that's a big way on the budget because now most of the money that, that you would have for scientific research is now being spent on warfare and the United States can't even win uh, wars in third world countries anymore. Maybe, maybe that will change the next time we have a new president. Maybe I'm not very optimistic. I'm disappointed that Bernie Sanders lost New York. So it means that Hillary Clinton is probably going to be to get the nomination and Trump won New York on the Republican side, so it's probably going to be Trump versus Clinton. And Hillary Clinton, when it comes to foreign policy and when it comes to economic policy, is very conservative. And Trump, when it comes to foreign policy and economic policy, is very conservative. So I'm not very optimistic with either of those, those candidates. But I am a, I'm a Bernie or Bus guy. Mm -hmm. So if Bernie Sanders doesn't get the – doesn't get the um, nomination, I'm going to write him in as a candidate. I'm not going to vote for Hillary. I don't like Hillary. Because Hillary Clinton spread a, spread a lot of lies about Bernie Sanders, saying right. he's going to take away your health care and all this kind of crap. Well, that's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Oh. Ray, Ray, what do you have to yeah. say? Sorry, I know, I know you don't normally talk about politics. So. No, that's okay. I mean, it, it is, you know, in the that's topics, I guess. It's part of topics, uh, you know. Uh, I wanted Ray to get a, a voice on on all the stuff we're talking about. So, uh, sorry about that. Yeah, I, I have a semi photographic memory and things that I really like, and so I can just go on forever. Uh, I didn't well, need to over. -talk. Looks like you would have no trouble somebody <laughs> hiring you as a scientific advisor. So, I don't. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a degree in science. Well, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't. I would say semi photographic memory on the air, same one, because the FBI might want to hire you up next. <laughs> I wish, I wish. What yeah. happened to, why don't you tell us again about that story that you broke on the Everything Show? Did anything come from that where um, anybody purchased your videotape? No, um, nobody's responded. I, I emailed People Magazine, which had, they had did an interview with Christian Slater in December because it's the lawsuit with Christian Slater versus his father, Tom Slater. Mm -hmm. It's been gone going for months, but amazingly, nobody's emailed me back. I guess they don't consider it that big of a deal. So I'm probably maybe you're not talking to the right people. Maybe it's different numbers you got to call or something. 
Well, I mean, maybe. I, I TMZ is the big one. That's the first one I eat. But you got the right numbers and everything? And, uh, and well, emails. I mean, TMZ has a – you could submit a tip for a story, and they have a form where you put your email and your contact info, including your phone number. So I gave TMZ – I went to their contact form, gave them my phone number and my email, and told them that it was Tom Slater and had an exclusive interview. Mm -hmm. But they haven't gotten back with me. They haven't even responded. And the same thing with People Magazine. I emailed People Magazine because People Magazine. Why don't you go? Why don't you go to ABC? Did the whole story about it, but then I, I was. Why don't I might you, go to MSN. That it's on MSNBC. Go ahead. Why, why, yeah. Why don't you go to MSNBC or or why don't you go to ABC or CBS or NBC and try to you know. I mean, I'll, I'll try. I'm sure there's a million people trying to don't do this. Don't they have, I mean, would, um, who, did, did, did they ever bring back current affair or anything like that? Or maybe they entertainment I don't know. I don't, tonight or. I don't, have, I don't have television, so I've been kind of off the grid. Maybe entertainment tonight or 60 minutes. <laughs> try to contact uh, CBS. Yeah, I'll try. I mean, uh, it's, it's hard because I'm kind of nobody, you know, I've only got like 500 something. Uh, well, Sixty-three subscribers. I'm not really considered that big of a deal. Everybody starts somewhere. Thing. That's point. right. Thank you, right? I was a little, I was struggling to come up with something. Yes. Thank you, right? Everybody starts. I'm not mean, oh, and I'm not going to say if you get it sold on there, then they might mention you, and you might get a ball rolling where they. Maybe you will be a thing. You're, you'll find well, a I mean, Investigative reporter. Because I figured. Because I just I figured since People Magazine interviewed Christian Slater and talked about. Christian Slater's side of the story, they might want to hear the other side. But they why, don't you call, why don't you call Howard Stern? I don't know his number. I mean, you see, I don't think you could just call Howard Stern. Let's I'm know. sure you could call in on the radio station or Sirius. That's a good idea. I might do that. Howard Stern's in New York, but maybe I can do it over the telephone. And I'm sure he would love you. You'd probably be a regular on the <laughs> – my well, I mean, I, I, well, I, mean I, I, I was on the Elisa Dorjana show, but I got bored with her show. She was she used to be a writer for Howard Stern. Why don't you just so, contact Howard Stern? Yeah. I, I, I would put all your re – I, I would say that's your safe bet. Yeah, I might do that because I definitely need some money. I, no, uh, you I, will do that 25 billion years in the future. Yes, you will. No, you will. Come on, dude. Yeah. You're right there. Non-linear space time. Yeah, do right. In parallel I'm, 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 universe, he's already done it. Yeah, I know. Because right I'm, trans, I'm transfixed in space and time. That's right. <laughs> All right. So this has been very interesting, and it, it gave me a new idea for a new show. So let me think about this topic here for a new show, podcast show. All right. On that note, thank you, Steampunk Star Raising. All right. Thank you, no Ray. Problem. Take care. Bye for now.